Hi, welcome to the Viva Bites. Today we'll be talking about uh, flight muscles in insects. Um, so, a characteristic insect, uh, not talking about dragonflies here at all, um, has two sets of muscles. So you've got the big indirect power muscles, um, which uh, sort of create the wing beat frequency um, and uh, the, they're the ones who drive the wings up and down. Um, and your second set of muscles are uh, steering muscles um, and depending on the insect there are between about 14, I think that was a blowfly, uh, there's an account of 17 or even up to 22 steering muscles. And what they do, um, whilst they represent less than 3% of the uh, total flight mass, they uh, are really important in fine-tuning the motions of the wings um, which in turn alter the force um, generated and distribution so you can in initiate turns for instance. Um, so I'll talk about the indirect power muscles first and then come on to the steering muscles. Uh, so the power muscles they are also known as the fibrilla or asynchronous or F muscles and um, they uh, sort of get inputs um, in the form of action potentials from both the mechanosensory pathways, that will be another video, um, but they also get action potentials from um, visual uh, descending neurons. These action potentials are not on every single beat, but they are usually on at a specific phase of the wing beat when they do uh, arrive. And there is actually some um, emerging evidence that there is an absolute spike frequency of the power muscles into neurons. Now, the, power, the action potentials are not what triggers the uh, contractions of these muscles. Um, so you've got two sets uh, that make up this sort of system. So you've got the dorsal longitudinal uh, system, so it sort of runs from behind the head in the thorax towards the abdomen. And then the dorsal ventral, which runs from, well, top, the, the, the back, to the um, ventral side of the fly. And, um, and the contractions are, as I said, not triggered by neural commands, but rather they are triggered by mechanical oscillations. In particular, the contractile proteins are activated by stretch. So when you've got one uh, of the two sets that stretches, um, is stretched, the other contracts. So you've got this sort of system whereby you've got a, 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 a resonant system, an oscillation, um, and um, therefore why, why bother have action potentials? Well, it's thought that they help to produce the correct ionic environment which is necessary for the contractions of actomyosin. So a good reference is Haider, 1983. Um, and I'm now coming on to the steering muscles. Um, I don't have a complete list, um, but um, do feel free to add um, to them in the comments. Uh, the first ones that I've got are the pteral 1 muscles, so 1 and 2. The pteral 3 muscles, 1, 2, 3 and 4. The basilar muscles, B1, B2 and B3. The posterior notal wing process, HG1, HG3, an HG4. There is officially an HG2 but it has no muscle attached to it. Instead it's fused to the thoracic wall and it's referred to as the posterior notal wing process. Then we have the pleurosternals, PS1 and PS2, great for the Game Boy lovers. Um, the tergo pleurals, uh, TP1 and TP2. And then the anterior pleural muscle, PA3. And finally, the turgo trochanter muscle. Um, as I said, this is not a complete list, so if, if, if I've definitely missed some out, please add them in the comments. Um, so the steering muscles, um, they are also called um, the uh, non-fibrilla or end muscles. And um, unlike the asynchronous power muscles, these synchronous muscles follow motor action potentials. So how does it work? So you've got a motor neuron which innervates a particular muscle and when that motor neuron is activated it then causes the muscle it innervates to twitch. The force from the twitch moves or deforms the sclerite to which the muscle is attached. Now sclerite is a bit of hard cuticle 
and the change in the scleric position then alters the wing motion and that then ch causes changes in the kinematics um, which leads into changes in the forces um, generated by each wing. Now different muscles can act synergistically um, and there's sort of redundancy between them um, or even antagonistically. So for instance the basilars and the um, teral three muscles uh, two to four and they interact it determines the maximum forward amplitude and when the b2 and the first teral three muscle uh, interact then together they increase stroke amplitude whereas the first uh, teral one and the third uh, muscle the posterior nose to wing process so hg3 um, so when they fire together, they decrease the stroke amplitude. Um, no single steering muscle can be considered in complete isolation from either its previous activity or other steering muscles. Um, so I'll now go into a little bit more depth about um, some of the uh, muscles. I don't have information on all of them, but the, probably the most important are the first two basilar muscles. So first basilar muscle. Um, it's unique in that it's the only one to, that fires on every single wing bait um, and it produces a single phase locked spike, uh, usually near dorsal stroke reversal, so pronation. The phase tuning um, of this of the B1 motor neuron is possibly the result of uh, wind beat synchronous afferents from the um, inputs from the wing and halter companiform sensilla. Uh, and potentially as well from the hinge pterial C, but not entirely sure on that one. Um, in blowflies, um, this muscle has been shown to generate some negative work, um, which is quite a, a specialization. But unlike B2, um, it shows a very graded response, so very sort of linear. Um, and the B1 muscle is uh, shown to be active during straight flight, so it's very important in core stabilization. And uh, changes in activation timing alter the yaw torque. Specifically, if it's activated early, it increases the amplitude of the wing. Um, each, keep in mind, um, a fly has got two wings, so each has its basilar muscle. Okay, so change in the uh, activation time so that it's activated early causes an increase in the amplitude of that wing in particular. Um, and the resulting effect is that you've got a, a, a ch the fly then goes into a turn, um, but that wing is on the outside of the turn. Um, there's also an increase in the protraction in the downstroke, um, and there's an increase in the stroke deviation during the downstroke, but there is no effect, surprisingly, on the upstroke. If the B1 is activated late, then you have a reduction. In amplitude of the wing so this then becomes the wing on the inside of the of a turn um, and the one has also been shown to control the ventral flip timing so supination moving on to the second basilar muscle um, also known as the abductor ally 2 um, this muscle usually generates one spike every second cycle so about Frequent, uh, spiking frequency of about 100 hertz and when it does fire it usually fires near pronation so just like B1. It can also fire in bursts if it's elicited by the visual turning stimulus and the B2 firing causes uh, rapid turns to a, towards or away from objects um, it's more of an all or nothing response unlike the B1 which was quite a graded response um, and it, so B2 firing also causes an increase in the ipsilateral uh, wing beat amplitude and actually also a small decrease in amplitude of the contralateral wing. Um, this then causes um, uh, an increase in the flight force um, on the ipsilateral side, so the side where it's firing, um, and therefore causes a turn away into the other direction, so that the wing where the B2 has fired is on the outside. So really the difference between the B1 and the B2 muscles 
B1 is always active, but the timing changes uh, the amplitude. Whereas B2 is simply activated. When, when B2 is activated, then it'll change the amplitude. If it's not, then it won't have any, um, any effect. The changes in timing of B2 does also alter the amplitude. Um, so it's being shown that there's a maximal, maximal increase in amplitude when B2 is stimulated at the beginning of the upstroke, so about one millisecond before the narrowband phase. This is in Drosophila and Anagasta, who've got a, a wing beat um, cycle of about three to five milliseconds. Um, and there's a delay of one millisecond between uh, when it's simulated, uh, when the nerve is simulated and the muscle is activated. Um, for more information, you want to probably go and see Lemon und Goetz, 96, because um, they've got a graph of uh, where they tried to um, activate the muscle at different stages of the wing beat cycle and see that how that affected uh, the wing beat's um, amplitude. Um, together, B1 and B2 um, are thought to maybe reconfigure the hinge um, from rest to be um, flight ready or flight appropriate um, and the downstroke deviation is controlled in part by a mechanical summation of basilar activity um, and it's actually been shown that if both b1 and b2 fail to fire then the wingtip generates um, a figure of eight and uh, now moving on to the terrell one uh, the first terrell one muscle so this one is shown to fire during the downstroke. That's all I have on it. Don't really have much more. Um, the first to the fourth Terrell three um, tend to fire near supination, and might be involved in regulating the angle of attack. Um, posterior notal wing process HG one is also called the adductor. So separate, uh, different from the abductor um, LA, which was the basilar two. Um, this one fires only when a contralateral uh, wing beats. Um, and then talking about the indirect pleurosternal muscle, PS1, this one fires continuously well below the wing beat frequency, which is about 200 in fruit fly. And the spikes can occur at any point in the wing beat, so there's no phase locking. And um, the most important job that the this one does, um, the pleurosternal one, um, but also pleurosternal two and tergal pleural TP1 and TP2, um, they uh, stiffen the thorax, create an inward force on the thoracic walls, and alter the wing beat frequency by altering the resonant properties of the hinge and thorax. So they are the ones who are able to. Uh, directly influence the wing beat frequency rather than changes to the power muscles. Uh, finally, the tergotrochanter uh, muscles, these are not actually found in all insects, for instance the cetaphylas don't have any, um, but they do seem to be present in Drosophila. Um, so they tend to be the jump muscles, they cause leg extension, quite useful when you're taking off. Um, and they might be important in deforming the thorax, uh, uh, initiating the resonant oscillations, um, perhaps are also involved in opening of the wing. Um, so that's it for um, the muscles. Thank you very much.